rate. The Jackalones have always been much more in the model of people who wanted to be perceived as being bad guys, tough guys, street guys. By the late 60s, Tony Jackaloni and his brother Vito were firmly ensconced as the ruling mafia powers on the streets of Detroit, and they carried themselves that way, especially Tony Jack. He was, he attempted to be, and was for many people, an intimidating physical presence. He was tall, well-dressed, and he projected an aura of, of menace. Well, he was very visible, and he was the, the person who people thought of when they thought of organized crime. So he was a uh, sort of a Hollywood version of a mobster, which is unusual in Detroit. He relished the image of being a well-dressed, uh, frightening individual, and he capitalized on that persona. During this period, another flurry of murders involving bookies and businessmen occurred, and the Jackaloni brothers were planted firmly in the suspicions of the FBI and local police. First, there was the murder of Caesar Adler, who had been running an illegal dice game at the Carlton House in the Seven Mile, Wyoming area of Northwest Detroit. He came up missing not long after Tony Jack was arrested in a raid on the operation by Detroit police. So, so Adler uh, was running this gambling house for the Jackalones. It gets raided. I think there was speculation on the street that Adler hadn't paid the cops off or hadn't you know, done his due diligence to make sure that the uh, place wasn't raided. And this upset the Jackalones. Yes, that is true. And also, Adler was also caught um, using loaded dice in his games. Um, that is a big no-no to use loaded dice in, dice in games. And these were games that the actual mobsters showed up to gamble at. It wasn't uh, always a situation where they were trying to scam you know, outsiders. They were actually you know, gambling themselves. So Adler was in, in turn trying to rip off his own bosses. So uh, Adler ended up in the trunk of his car on uh, around 10 in Greenfield, the Lincoln, uh, Lincoln Center shopping plaza. Uh, that is correct. He was found in the trunk of his car, strangled to death in a very, very similar manner to the murder of Gustin Dramos in 1947 and Jack George in 1950. Harvey Leach, a prominent young businessman in Oakland County, came up missing after going to a meeting with Leonard Schultz, a man whose name would later come up in several other high-profile cases, including the disappearance of Jimmy Hoffa. Uh, Harvey Leach was a 34, 35 year old businessman from the area that owned Joshua Door Furniture, which eventually became Mr. Robinson's Furniture. And Door, uh, Joshua Door was allegedly started, uh, according to FBI files, by startup money by the Jackaloni brothers. Or Tony Jackaloni had given possibly Harvey Leach money to start the business up and was acting as a silent partner. Uh, Leach was on his way to see a man named Leonard Schultz, who is an associate of the Jackaloni brothers. Uh, the next time anyone saw him, Leach ended up in the trunk of a car. Uh, that is correct. He was found the next day with his throat slit in the trunk of his car on the day he was supposed to be married. Then there was the case of Saul Schindel, Jewish bookmaker that operated out of a popular downtown watering hole. In the late 1960s and early 1970s, the Anchor Bar was the headquarters of Saul Schindel. Good looking Solly, as they called him on the street. Sherman and Schindel ran their activities out of this bar with help from Jack Maloney Lieutenants Bobby LaPuma and Ronnie Morelli. Morelli and LaPuma acted as Schindel and Sherman's collectors. The Anchor Bar operation was raided and Schindel, Sherman, and several Jackaloni lieutenants were indicted. People in the syndicate begin to worry that Schindel's two indictments could lead to him flipping and turning government witness. Things are exacerbated in early December of 1971 when Schindel, Lapuma, Morelli, and several other members of the Detroit Mafia head to Las Vegas for a weekend jaunt. Schindel goes on a bit of a bender, a two or three day gambling spree where he loses up to a quarter of a million dollars. Allegedly, some of this money wasn't even his own, and he had taken money from the Jackaloni till and went and gambled it away in Las Vegas. Reports of that time period were that Schindel was very worried. Schindel was found with three bullets in the face, dead on the ground at his house on Pennsylvania Avenue in Southfield, Michigan, the result of crossing the Detroit Mafia. This string of high profile murders culminated in the largest investigation the FBI has ever conducted and an epic piece of the 20th century American mythology. I would be very happy to have our legal counsel here, our legislative representative here, assisting me in spending as much time as necessary to acquaint the American people with the fact that this is a strike-breaking union-busting bill, in my well, opinion. Mr. Hoffa, this bill is not a strike-breaking union-busting bill. You're the best argument I know for it. Your testimony here this afternoon, your complete indifference to the fact that numerous 
people who hold responsible positions in your union come before this committee and take the Fifth Amendment because an honest answer might tend to incriminate them. Your complete indifference to it, I think, makes this bill essential. Jimmy Hoffa came to Detroit from the countryside of Indiana to seek his fortune. Before long, he was helping to build the Teamsters Union into one of the most powerful forces in the American economic system. As truck drivers and cartage haulers, the Teamsters controlled what moved and what didn't move across the roads of America. But not everyone was happy with the Teamsters. The AFL-CIO expelled them in the 1950s, and in 1957, Teamsters president Dave Beck was sent to prison for bribery. Jimmy Hoffa then moved into the presidency and found himself targeted by the Kennedy brothers in a series of congressional hearings. In 1964, Hoffa was convicted of jury tampering and sentenced to 15 years in prison. President Richard Nixon commuted Hoffa's sentence to time served in 1971 with the proscription that Hoffa could not return to union activities for 10 years. Jimmy Hoffa was back on the streets, operating from Teamsters headquarters on Trumbull Avenue near Tiger Stadium in Detroit. But while he was gone, his one-time protege, Frank Fitzsimmons, had become Teamsters president. For the next several years, Hoffa worked behind the scenes to regain his presidency, but by 1975, the battle between him and Fitzsimmons was out in the open and was about to get violent. It's the spring of 1975, and Hoffa and his former protege, Frank Fitzsimmons, are embroiled in a bitter power struggle for the Teamsters presidency. Mr. Fitzsimmons, at this point, is firmly ensconced in Hoffa's old-time presidency seat, and members of the mafia that had once helped Hoffa attain the presidency are pretty content with keeping Fitzsimmons in the post. In the midst of this battle with Fitzsimmons over the Teamsters presidency, Hoffa called for a meeting at Nemo's Bar in downtown Detroit, ostensibly to come to some agreement with his rival. Hoffa never showed, but Fitzsimmons and his son did, Richard Little Fitz Fitzsimmons. They had lunch here at Nemo's, and while they, while they left and headed to the parking lot out to their car, their car blew up. A bomb had detonated. The bombing of suspected mafia puppet Frank Fitzsimmons didn't sit well with either the Detroit family nor with certain powerful mobsters on the East Coast, most notably Anthony Tony Pro Provenzano, whom Hoffa had fought with in the mess hall at Atlanta Federal Prison years earlier. Following the bombing incident at Nemo's in May of 1975, Hoffa was living on borrowed time. Less than two months later, Hoffa was called to a meeting at the Marcus Red Fox in Bluefield Hills, Michigan, to have a sit-down with two very powerful mobsters, one being Tony Giacalone, the Detroit Mafia street boss, the other being Tony Provenzano, a New Jersey mafiosi. Hoffa was supposed to meet him at the Marcus Red Fox restaurant and then go with him to a meeting. By July 30th, 1975, when Hoffa was called to a meeting here, he was living on borrowed time. Six weeks previous, he had been suspected in playing a role in the bombing of uh, his successor in the Teamsters presidency, Frank Fitzsimmons, and his son, Little Fitz, Richard Fitzsimmons' car was blown up outside of Nemo's. This uh, upset the Detroit Mafia and really made Hoffa's execution slash disappearance a priority. Hoffa's diary entry for the day he went missing lists Tony Provenzano, Tony Giacalone, and Leonard Schultz, who was also the man that Harvey Leach was going to see before he came up missing, as the people he was going to meet at the Marcus Red Fox restaurant in suburban Detroit. Giacalone was to be present at the meeting between Tony Pro and Hoffa as the Detroit family's representative, following mob protocol. If a family from somewhere else wanted to come here and do something in Detroit, they need to get permission from the Detroit people to do it. So even if you subscribe to the theory that the people ultimately responsible are in fact from the East Coast, the, the LCN structure would have required approval, authorization, and participation by the Detroit family. Provenzano is one of three people Hoffa apparently thought he was going to meet that day. Names of the others, reportedly recalled by a witness who underwent hypnosis, were Leonard Schultz, a Detroit labor consultant with a long criminal record, and Anthony Giacalone, described as an important figure in the Detroit Mafia. Tony Jack never showed up for his meeting with Jimmy Hoffa, but he was sure to make his face seen around the Southfield Athletic Club, which was being managed by his old buddy Leonard Schultz around the time Hoffa went missing. Jimmy Hoffa disappeared, he was in the building here, getting his shoes shined, asking yeah, everybody 
what, what time Tony Jack didn't talk to anyone yeah. ever, but on, yeah, on July 30th, 1975, he, everyone that walked past him, he asked, uh, he said hi and how, what time it was. Police haven't talked to Jackaloni yet, but through an associate, Jackaloni has offered an alibi for last Wednesday. He says he spent midday Wednesday at this office building in nearby Southfield, meeting his accountant and his attorney. Then he says he went to the Southfield Athletic Club, got a haircut and a rub down. Seemingly stood up for his meeting, Hoffa milled around the Marcus Red Fox and made a phone call from a nearby hardware store. Soon after, a sedan with three men pulled up and Jimmy Hoffa got in. He has never been seen since. As soon as Jimmy Hoffa left this parking lot around 2.45 on July 30th, 1975, he immediately became one of America's most infamous unsolved missing persons cases in the history of American crime. Police continue today to run down anonymous tips, such as one that said Hoffa's body could be found in this lake. Police searched, the report proved false. At day's end, police still didn't seem much closer to knowing what happened to Jimmy Hoffa. The government, well, technically the government probably knows who did it and how it was done, but and has some evidence, but not enough to indict because the people who actually did it are either now deceased or very close mouth, and they're just not talking. Of course, that wasn't the end of the story of Jimmy Hoffa. The FBI continued its investigation for years, focusing, for one thing, on the fact that Vito Giacalone, Tony's brother, was the only member of the Detroit mob hierarchy unaccounted for by surveillance teams that day. Billy Giacalone, a captain and the brother of street boss Tony Giacalone, was unaccounted for that day by FBI surveillance. Between 10 o'clock that morning and around 5 o'clock that afternoon, Giacalone was off the radar. A lot of FBI agents believe that, that the reason why is because Giacalone was the Detroit mob's representative at the Hoffa hit. And certainly because it's in this area on his turf or on their turf, uh, a representative is going to have to be here. He would be the most logical person coupled with the fact that nobody saw him that day. Uh, now, again, since 1975, there have been many numerous theories that have uh, abounded about where Hoffa was taken, how he was done away with. One, one theory that has recently come to light and didn't really come to light during the uh, main focus of the Hoffa investigation in the late 70s, and this theory was uh, proffered to me by a number of FBI agents that worked the case and with their perspective now looking back on the case, they feel like this theory could be uh, a real missing link in the investigation. Now, that theory is that Hoffa was taken to this house off Long Lake Road in Bluefield Hills, a mere less than two miles away from the Marcus Red Fox. Although this house right now was previously owned at the time of the Hoffa disappearance by Carlo Lakata, a Detroit Mafia soldier and the brother-in-law of Jack Toko and Tony Toko. The Lakata house itself became the site of a strange incident that bore all the hallmarks of the Detroit Mafia family in 1981. On the six year anniversary of Hoffa's disappearance, July 30th, 1981, when Carlo Lakata, Jack Toko's brother-in-law, was found dead at this location. Now, uh, Lakata was found uh, in his master bedroom with uh, two gunshot wounds to the chest and the gun uh, several feet away from the body. Originally, this, uh, this death was ruled a suicide, but uh, there are many, many, uh, several uh, law enforcement agents that believe that there's more to meet the eye than merely a suicide here, and that the fact that Lakata's death happened on the six-year anniversary of the Hoffa disappearance says something and relates to the Hoffa uh, uh, assassination to the degree that possibly Lakata knew a little bit too much and was, was using that as a trump card and possibly the Detroit Mafia killed him uh, as a message to everyone else that even those closest to us will be done away with. And the fact that uh, Carl Lakata was Jack Toko's brother-in-law really didn't seem to uh, matter, at least according to these FBI uh, agents' theories on the Hoffa uh, assassination. But this house right here, the former house of Carl Lakata, definitely, although has not got the notoriety of some other theories, definitely plays a major role in possibly what happened to Jimmy Hoffa. With Jimmy Hoffa's unsolved disappearance fresh in the minds of the federal government, they decided to go after the Detroit family street boss, Tony Jack, in another way, income tax evasion. The IRS had been dogged. They had 
looked at him primarily because they thought they could find something when it was much more difficult for, for example, the FBI to find a, a routine, usual crime that required someone on the spot to testify against them. So the IRS 